Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 40th Annual Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Thank you for coming to this panel entitled Water, Pollinators, and Public Spaces, a Local Model for Collaborative Pesticide Policy Reform. My name is Kat Loden. I am a conference co-director, and I will be moderating this panel. I just have a few announcements before we get started. First of all, some tech information. Don't worry if you can't see yourselves. This is a Zoom webinar, so all of the attendees are automatically muted with their videos off, so you will only be able to see the panelists. Throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. All of our panelists will be giving their presentations, and then there will be a 15-minute Q&A session at the end where the panelists will answer your questions. Please remember to be courteous of all viewpoints during the presentation and the Q&A session. Additionally, if there are there are any legal professionals in the audience wanting to earn CLE credit for this panel, we will provide you with a link to a document with all the information you need shortly. Also on this document is information about how to make a donation to the Public Interest Environmental Law Summer Stipend Program. Our alumni board, Friends of Land Air Water, helps provide stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law work. If you're interested in making a donation to help provide students with these stipends, Information on how to do so will also be in this document. Lastly, the University of Oregon is located on the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribe of Siletz Indian of Oregon and continue to make important contribution to their communities at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Polk would like to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya people in the Willamette Valley and express our respect for the tribal nations of Oregon. I will now introduce the panelists. First, Lisa Arkin is the director of Beyond Toxics. She has provided innovative policy leaderships and grassroots organizing for the statewide environmental justice organization since 2007. Under her guidance, Beyond Toxics embraced the principles of diversity and equity and adopted an anti-racist ethos to become Oregon's first environmental justice organization. Lisa is dedicated to placing human rights, racial and social justice at the forefront of all environmental protection and climate resiliency policies. Jennifer Isley is the pesticide manager for Beyond Toxics. She received her tribal FIFRA inspector credential from the US EPA region nine and was formerly a Triber, Tribal Pesticide Solid Waste Program Coordinator for Shoshone Paiute Tribes of the Duck Valley Indian Reservation in Idaho, Nevada. Jennifer also serves as the Oregon Division of Land Conservation and Development Citizens Involvement Advisory Committee and is passionate about equity and environmental justice. Michael Wargo became Willamette Lane's superintendent in 2018. He holds a bachelor's degree in health, ed physical education and recreation from the College of New Jersey and a master's degree in education and sports management from East Stroudsburg University of Pennsylvania. He has more than 25 years of experience in athletics, parks and recreation, and worked in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana prior to moving to Oregon in 2016. He enjoys exploring the Pacific Northwest with his wife, two sons, and three dogs. Kenny Wiegand joined Willam Lane in 2018 and became the community engagement director in 2022. He is a proud Oregon Duck and has a bachelor's degree in economics. He has about 14 years of experience in marketing and communication in a variety of industries, but has found his true passion with parks and recreation. Kenny's favorite pastimes include kayaking, running, hiking, basketball, and spending time with his wild and crazy family. Lastly, Eric Adams became the Parks Planning and Facilities Director in 2018. He holds a bachelor's degree in environmental science from Northern Arizona University and a master's degree in urban regional planning from Minnesota State University. He has more than 20 years of experience in land use planning and urban development prior to joining the Willamette Lane team in 2017. Eric's passions include cycling, running, and enjoying the natural beauty of Oregon with his family. With that, I will pass it over to the panelists. Thank you very much, Kat, and uh, welcome everyone to this <clears throat> presentation and panel. We're very excited to share with you uh, a very innovative and hopefully um, a program others can model about collaborative work to solve a problem, to do, um, to address community concerns and um, 
recreational district concerns and come up with a marvelous problem solving and capacity building uh, path forward. And we're eager to share how we did all that with you. So um, I'm gonna talk first just a little bit about the beginnings of the relationship I, with Beyond Toxics and the Willamette Lane <clears throat> Park District. Uh, a few years ago, I always say prior to COVID, we had already connected with Eric Adams, uh, who you've been introduced to, uh, to work together on a project called Non-Toxic Oregon. Non-Toxic Oregon is a program that where we work with <clears throat> uh, the organization Beyond Pesticides, a turf management expert, Chip Osborne, and local cities or counties to create safe public spaces that uh, are places parents can take their kids and families can go visit without worrying about exposures to harmful chemicals such as pesticides, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and this takes a lot of dedication from park staff. And we're so grateful to Eric Adams for being willing to step up and uh, be part of a test program. So in, I think it was 2018, uh, we held a marvelous and uh, standing room only workshop for not only Willamette Lane Parks and District, but also surrounding cities who sent their land management folks out to learn how to manage turf without the use of harmful herbicides or pesticides. And uh, that was a marvelous relationship we were building back then. And then the pandemic hit and things were put on hold a little bit. But the plan was to really invest in soil health and nurturing environments where uh, invasive weeds would not uh, be able to establish themselves and to improve the look and durability of turf without using pesticides. Um, so that was a wonderful way to start our relationship, to form some trust, <clears throat> and I think made a big difference in our ability to work together under other uh, sort of urgent circumstances. <clears throat> and so um, we came to work together on issues of community concern about the Doris Ranch uh, hazelnut orchard, which is within a larger public park system that Willamette Lane manages, and it is referred to Doris Ranch. So it's both a working hazelnut orchard where nuts are harvested from the orchard and sold commercially. And I know that folks from Willamette Lane are gonna talk more about the marvelous and unique historic nature of this facility. So I won't go into that now, but just to say that um, people in the community really didn't have any idea that what they thought of as a public park was also being managed with traditional agricultural methods to, uh, to harvest, to grow and harvest hazelnuts, sometimes called filberts. And uh, sometimes that uh, conventional agricultural method could be very chemical intensive. And so there was you know, this sort of conflict where people wanted their park to be a park where they could go anywhere in the park, like these pictures show where children climb on trees and people take their uh, dogs and have family picnics or wedding photo shoots. And they just walk into the park assuming that pesticides would not be sprayed in that setting. And yet very harsh chemicals were being sprayed often without any community prior knowledge. And I know we'll talk more about community notification. So it really brought into great um, focus the conflicts that might exist between having a commercial orchard within a public park. And I do want to say when we talked to the Oregon Department of Agriculture, we found out that Doris Ranch is not the only place that this uh, coexistence of conventional agriculture and public park exists. And the Oregon Department of Agriculture actually acknowledged that this might be something that they should be paying more attention to. Um, so I will now hand it over to Jennifer to continue the story of um, 
collaborative problem solving. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, so Beyond Toxics responded when um, there were a bunch of neighbor complaints. They reached out to us. It was ongoing on social media. A community member was just trying to requesting people, making people aware of what was being applied down there and, you know, asking that they reach out to the board of directors and ask them not to do it or change their practices. Um, she lived in a little neighborhood that that is adjacent to the park and um, the fence line next to the orchard that separates the houses is as close as probably 60 feet in some, some areas um, where pesticides were being applied. And the concerns that were, that were discussed were potential pesticide runoff to the Willamette River, um, pollinator protection, people, um, human exposure to both to park visitors and the, the residential area next to the park, pets, people walk their dogs there, wildlife. Um, this is a picture of the pesticide label that, that really got our attention. It's a restricted use pesticide product. Um, it does have the ingredient of xylene, which is a nervous, central nervous system depressant. And um, we were hoping that they could, you know, use another product. So we started, um, oh, do you want to move to the next slide, please? Uh, we started communicating with Willamaline by email. Um, we put out a public records request into Willamaline and we were asked for the pesticide application records, their integrated pest management plan, which might identify um, cultural practices that could reduce the the amount of pesticides being used in the orchard. And again, we were kind of starting to look at their process for park closures and public notifications and wanting to learn more about that. Um, at a later point, we, we put in a public records request to Department of Agriculture. They were pulled into our email communication um, Again, we at that point we did not realize that the park was being operated as a as a private private orchard. Um, we found that out later in the process after we it was it was clearly explained to us after we got our public records request from Department of Agriculture. Um, we were communicating about um, applicator exclu or application exclusion zones, pesticide buffer zones, and again, um, more, uh, more information about how they notify the public and close the park. Um, next slide, please. So, um, after, after some of this communication was going on, there was, there was some really good signage up um, that is the front entrance to the park and then um, this other photo was taken at there's a foot trail entrance in at the back side of the park close to the river um, so the the signage was has it was improved um, there are still some foot trails that aren't managed by Willamette Lane where people can access the orchard and they did access or the orchard the day of the applications, even with all of this signage up. So we were just concerned about protecting the public. Next slide, please. So these photos were taken by Department of Agriculture um, the day, day of the spray of the Asana um, pesticides. This is typical, a typical um, orchard air blast, you know, regular equipment that they use. Um, next slide. And that this was taken by the agricultural inspector who was inside the park during the spray and it just kind of um, represents the particulate small particulates that come ultra low volume um, spray that comes out of the air blast sprayer it just kind of lingers in the air and in really hot temperatures it kind of um, 
you know, there is, there's always the potential for off target drift. Next slide, please. These were also taken by Department of Agriculture the day of the spray. Um, the first picture is showing one of the residents right next to the orchard um, taken from, from inside the park. And there is a little drift card um, that, that, that Will Ameline was using to you know, detect drift if it, if it did happen. Um, it, it didn't that day that they knew of. Um, this was a pesticide sample that that was taken by the agricultural um, Department of Agricultural Observation inside the park. The next slide. Oh, and uh, Jennifer, not to interrupt, but just wanted to mention that there were concerns about high temperatures that day. And um, the fact that Asana has the xylene and is very aromatic and can off gas easily in high temperatures was uh, a, a point that we all came together around and Will Amelaine made sure to tell the orchardist, you know, that if the temperature goes above a certain amount that all spray should be ceased. But nonetheless, it was a very, very hot summer day. Um, and so people around the park, most people in Oregon don't have air conditioning. They open their windows when it, uh, or try to get some uh, draft going or might have a ventilation system that pulls in air into the home. Uh, so I just wanted to, to mention that. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, and so the evening before, before they started spraying down there um, in early August, um, Lisa and I walked the neighborhood. We talked to you know, some of the residents. We set out some sample trays in a few backyards. Um, this is one of the homes where we put out a sample tray next to their air conditioning unit. Um, this family was a um, Latino family. There, there were some language barriers. Um, they were not aware of the spray. They didn't get the notice. Um, when we came back and we picked up the samples from their home, um, we took some vegetation samples off of their squash plant. Um, those, those let, we sent those off to another lab to be analyzed. Um, these samples did come back with low levels of um, Asana, the Asana active ingredient. Um, at which point, you know, we notified Willamaline, we notified Department of Agriculture. Um, Department of Agriculture did come back and collect samples from the same site. Um, we, we knew that, that our samples were never going to be considered as, um, you know, um, they were going to question the validity of our samples. But the point of doing that was just to bring Will Amelaine to the table. We were never um, trying to use that as an enforcement action. It was more of a point of starting a conversation with Willamaline. Um, so then, um, so Department of Agriculture came and got the samples. At that point, we waited for them to do their lab analysis, which again came back negative. Um, they didn't pick up the samples till nearly a month after the application. But at the time that they did that, they also sampled again inside the orchard. And there was still a significant level of residue from where they collected their samples inside the orchard. Um, next slide. Okay, and then when we also got our public records request back from um, the Department of Agriculture, um, we see this a lot. It's just um, this, this kind of record keeping um, barely meets the requirements of the law, but it's, it's not adequate record keeping, in my opinion, um, we are still working on policy changes with Department of Agriculture. <laughs> and um, I think Will Amelaine has adopted some new internal policies because of this. But now we just want to um, turn this presentation over to Will Amelaine. Um, they were very responsive to the information that we brought forward. And we just would like to give them the opportunity to explain this process and um, share the outcomes. Hi, 
Great, thank you, uh, Jennifer. And Lisa, if it's possible, if you could put that slide up there with the children playing in the orchard, I think that'd be a great backdrop as, as we talk. So once again, um, hello everyone. My name is Michael Wargo. I'm the superintendent of the Lamelaine Park and Recreation District. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, co-present with uh, Lisa and Jennifer and my team, Eric and, and Kenny, um, especially really, um, really uh, uh, proud to be a part of the 40th annual Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. So just a little bit about Willamalane, just so you have a little bit perspective. I have no idea, I don't wanna assume that everyone knows who we are and, and uh, where we're located, but we're based in Springfield, Oregon. We're in the Willamette Valley within Lane County. Um, we actually created our name by combining Willamette and Lane, and that's where we came up with Willamalane. We're the first, um, Park and Recreation District in the state of Oregon. We're very proud of that. We were created back in 1944. We're about two hours south of Portland and our neighbors to the west are, is Eugene, Oregon, also home of the University of Oregon. We serve about 65,000 people in our jurisdiction. Um, as I mentioned before, we are a special tax district, so we're not part of the city. We're a standalone government entity, a quasi-governmental agency that collects our own tax base. That's where we get the majority of our revenues from, but we are also very much reliant on additional revenues such as um, fees, fee-based programs that we have, rentals, membership sales, um, sponsorships, partnerships, as well as, believe it or not, uh, sales from um, Filberts. Uh, so we are uh, responsible for 46 parks. We have natural areas totaling over 1,500 acres. We have 10 waterfront areas, uh, over 29 miles of hiking and biking trails that's uh, growing almost <laughs> with every season. We have 27 playgrounds and four public rec recreational areas. So we are a full functioning, large scale park and recreation district. We're passionate about what we do. We are passionate about the people that we serve. And one thing that we do take some great pride in is the fact that we do listen um, when concerns are raised by either groups like Beyond Toxics or uh, members of the community that we are active listeners and um, we really take great pride in resolving issues that are in the best interest of everyone that we serve. Um, a couple other opportunities that we've had is, since I've been superintendent, um, and this is my fourth year serving in that capacity, we had some issues at our Georgia Pacific property regarding some equestrian trails. Um, and we were able to navigate through multiple property owners in the city to be able to, for the first time in our history, allow equestrian trail use in one of our parks. In another one of our parks, we were having issues where we had these wonderful talking stones um, that were placed by members of the Kalapuyan Nation. And there were some of our amenities that started to encroach upon some of these talking stones. So through a lot of conversation and us listening, we were able to come to a suitable solution by moving some of those amenities and really tr uh, being respectful to these talking stones. So, um, when the Doris Ranch situation came up, um, it's a very unique park, as Lisa mentioned at the start of this. Um, it is a National Historic Preservation Site. It's a very popular park of site, and it's the first commercial filbert orchard of its type in the United States. So what has happened was there's this intersection of all this popularity, us trying to run a commercial filbert orchard, I also want to mention that we don't run, uh, manage it or harvest it ourselves. We contract that out to a, an orchardist. Um, they are a, a family-owned business. They don't have a lot of administrative support. I think is you know what you, you saw their logs. I mean that kind of shows you the type of operation that they have. But they have done a, a really a fantastic job up to this point of managing you know this orchard. So when we started getting feedback about our practices um, within the orchard, and I was really happy that Lisa you know, mentioned that we started having conversations about some of our agricultural practices long before this even happened. We did get a, a basically a hit a pause button when COVID hit, but when um, Beyond Toxics and members of the community started coming forth and, and asking our board of recommendation, our, our board of directors, 
um, if they could do something about the way that we currently manage the park. The board instructed me to do something about it. And what I chose to do was create an ad hoc committee that would really take a look at all of our practices, everything from closures of the parks, special events that we have, revenues, you name it, and put together a committee that would make some recommendations back to the board on what we want to do moving forward for the agricultural maintenance of the orchards themselves. Um, very, very pleased with the committee that we were able to put together. We actually had a member of our board, Brooke Reinhardt, served. We had a member of the National Park Service. We had um, a staff member from the Commercial and Community Horticultural Department from the uh, Oregon State University Extension. We had Lisa Arkin from Beyond Toxics. We had Jennifer Isley from Beyond Toxics. We had a community member that um, lived uh, in property adjacent to uh, Doris Ranch. And then from a lamelling standpoint, I served on the committee. Eric Adams, my planning parks and facilities director, uh, division director served, as well as Damon Kroon, who oversees the management of the orchard. He's our landscape and grounds uh, program manager. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Eric to talk a little bit about the practices that we were doing up to this point, and then really get into some of the recommendations that we um, made to the board and the changes that we're very happy to make for this coming growing season. Eric? Got to find that mute button first. Thanks, Michael. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I wish uh, we could see how many of you are out there, but uh, again, appreciate you paying attention and, and can't wait to talk more about this when we get to the Q&A session of the presentation. But um, yeah, as Michael said, uh, Doris Ranch and the Orchards uh, have a, a lot of history, a lot of import to the community and the region, um, about 75 acres in total. Uh, the oldest commercial filbert orchard uh, west of the Mississippi, as we like to say, and uh, we continue to manage them effectively going forward um, in light of their designation as a National Historic District, uh, in addition to being part of a larger public park. Uh, but for those of you uh, who may not be familiar with filbert orchard management practices, uh, we unfortunately have been managing now for several years, uh, trying to keep at bay uh, a fungal infection of eastern filbert blight uh, within the entirety of the orchards. And so that really drives a lot of the management decisions and, and tasks that we have to do on a, a seasonal and annual basis. Um, as a result of that, uh, one of the, uh, the applications of uh, conventional products that we've had to do in the past is uh, a fungicide, a fungicide, uh, which Jennifer showed. Um, some photos of an aerial uh, blast spray application, uh, which is the same method that we use for Eastern filbert blight. Um, uh, in addition, uh, we also treat for another uh, crop pest called uh, filbert worm, uh, which uh, they are deposited um, by moths that come into the orchards from a variety of different areas. And then the larva uh, feast on uh, the nuts, uh, the meat of the nuts, which obviously can have a, a pretty uh, deleterious effect on uh, the crop harvest and, and the revenue that's possible. Uh, so, so we've historically treated uh, for filbert worm. Um, and then in addition to that, just in terms of general uh, crop area maintenance and management, uh, we've done weed abatement uh, using uh, herbicides, as well as, uh, for those of you, again, who may not be aware of uh, the growth habit of filbert trees, uh, they do produce suckers or uh, smaller uh, limbs, branches that come up from the base of the tree over, as part of their normal growth habit. And um, if those are allowed to get established and grow uh, continuously, they'll take energy away from uh, the tree itself, as well as the uh, nut production capacity of the trees. And so our orchardist has seasonally treated for those using uh, an herbicide uh, as well. Um, each of those applications ha have been done consistent with uh, the corresponding guidelines and, and laws uh, that are um, enforced through Oregon Department of Agriculture uh, and EPA. Uh, we work very closely with our orchardists to provide uh, adequate notification of when those applications are going to occur. And prior to um, 
Beyond Tactics reaching out to us and, and asking some questions just about our general management practices. Uh, those full closures of the orchard and the park were a regular occurrence for us uh, on each of those instances, along with notification signage, um, um, information out on our websites, uh, et cetera. So we, we definitely uh, appreciated having an opportunity to talk further with staff, or not with staff, with, but with Beyond Toxics and, and some of the neighbors that had reached out to them directly to see how we could further improve those practices uh, going forward. And uh, we actually were in the process of doing exactly that um, at the time Beyond Toxics had reached out to us. So that, that coincided really well uh, with some existing efforts. Um, I think what else would be important for you to, to learn about? Um, we, uh, going forward from uh, the ad hoc committee that was formed and, and some of the recommendations that it presented, uh, our board uh, carefully considered all the information that the committee uh, prepared and presented. Uh, that included um, up to and including a, a, an immediate transition to organic management practices. Uh, that is something that as a district, we are still exploring the feasibility of. Uh, there's a lot of factors and considerations that, that go into um, making that change and moving in that direction. Uh, and, you know, fortunately, there's a, a growing and um, expanding uh, market sector within Oregon and within the Willamette Valley in terms of filbert orchard management and uh, their production that uh, is becoming more and more uh, prevalent in terms of organic management practices and uh, the market base to support that from uh, basically, you know, start of start of management of the orchards at the beginning of the growing season in March, all the way through um, getting the nuts uh, harvested and processed and, and to market. So we'll continue to focus on that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the recommendation that our board accepted and, and that we've since implemented is transitioning to management practices that uh, rely solely on um, uh, products with a, a caution label, uh, if, if at all, um, so really the, the lowest level of, of potential toxicity uh, to the environment and the public. And um, thankfully, we were already utilizing uh, several of, of those types of products as part of our normal management practices uh, and uh, transitioning completely to that approach uh, should be fairly straightforward for us. And, and like I said, in the meantime, we'll continue to look at feasibility of transitioning to uh, a full organic management practice uh, over time. I think that covers all that we went through in terms of uh, looking at the recommendations and our management practices before and to this point. So, uh, so the committee that, that was formed during the summer of 2021, we ended up meeting seven times from August until uh, when we made the recommendations to the Willamaline board in January. And Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, um, what exactly was the final recommendation about, uh, was it class one and class two? Um, you know, so for the immediate, um, you know, removal of that in the products that, that we use. So I thought that was something that we were all very, very proud to be able to, to um, call out and also start to implement this spring of 2022. And there was a lot of conversation about organics. That is something that um, we are going to strive to continue to build to. Um, you know, there's a lot of work, you know, as, as we are a public entity, we have to make sure that we are being fiduciarily responsible and what are the costs involved. But uh, to me, that would be something that would be really, really unique and um, attractive to me as superintendent to not only have the oldest commercial filbert orchard, west of the Mississippi, as Eric likes to say, but also um, if we could add organic to that as well. I mean, that is a goal. Work has to be done before we get to that. But, um, you know, but I was, again, very, uh, very, very pleased with the outcome of that, of that recommendation in our January meeting. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to my chief information officer, Kenny Wygant, who will just talk a little bit about the communications that um, we used and um, as he is a very proactive professional, as we were going through this process, he and his team um, implemented some new communication um, strategies uh, because we knew that uh, we had some, some shortfalls there. So Kenny, take it away. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, 
one of the things that was part of this process was we, we really were working with the committee to make sure that we could make informed recommendations to our board of directors. Um, that took a little bit more time um, to actually get this in front of the board. One of the things we didn't have to wait for was how we changed our communication strategy. So um, I was not a part of the, the ad hoc committee, but I was being really closely, closely following everything that was going forward um, and listening to every, uh, every bit of feedback that came through our board of directors and everything that came through Michael and Eric. And what we did is we kind of looked at what we were doing before. So we were issuing public notices um, prior to the summer of 2021. Um, but we realized that we had some shortcomings there. We were issuing things on our website. Um, we were doing some short versions of social media um, and we were posting signs, uh, closing the park whenever there was a treatment. Um, but hearing the input from the community, we, we wanted to try to find some new tactics to kind of improve on that. So um, starting with that, the first thing, and I'm glad, I'm glad the photo of the new signs are out. Um, we looked at all of the signs that we were putting up, made sure that those are all translated and those are permanent signs that can always be out. So really important if there are language barriers, we wanna make sure that we're trying to meet people as best we possibly can in that regard. Um, the thing that was probably the most uh, impactful to see uh, from, a, from a number standpoint is we created a dedicated email newsletter. Um, you can still currently go to alamalane.org slash subscribe and you can kind of select different newsletters to follow things throughout our district. One of those is a dedicated newsletter for uh, Doris Ranch. Um, whenever we were having to issue a treatment, um, we would put out the information in the newsletter to let people know not only were we closing the orchard uh, for safety concerns, but we, we were starting to add more information so people would be aware of what we were treating um, and the, the products that we'd be using. Um, it was really important for us to note that, uh, according to the committee, because people needed to know, you know what, what, type of, what type of a closure is this? It's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, we also were sharing that information at uh, willamalane.org slash Doris Ranch and on our alerts page, which is willamalane.org slash alerts. And we were using our newsletter and social media to send people to a location where they could get that information. Um, we we're also giving more information about the, the estimated duration of closures. Um, I think as Eric mentioned, we can't say to the date when things are going to happen uh, because of seasonality and uh, uh, the weather conditions that go into that. But we were able to give a little bit more information at the request of the community as to when and how they could access the park in and around these. Um, we also have a dedicated uh, Facebook page. So we have 46 parks. We have one park that has its own Facebook page, and that's Doris Ranch, um, in large part because of this type of communication. We're trying to, trying to reach people in, in different areas or avenues than they had before. Um, for neighbors, uh, we changed our practices to now send direct mail to neighbors, um, notifying them of any treatments that would be taking place. Um, and as we move forward, we're not done. We're, we're, we're going to continue to listen to figure out where the gaps are in our communication. Um, one of the things that's, that we really are, are proud of is that we can be really flexible and nimble when we have problems like this come up. Um, I really appreciate every member of the community that told us um, areas where they felt like they were left short, and that allows us to try to fill those gaps. Um, public notifications and public communication is always a challenge because there's so many people that receive information in different channels and different methods. Um, but what we are trying to do is layer, make it a layered approach, not a one-size-fits-all approach to make sure that we're trying to connect as many people the information that they want, especially about Doris Ranch. So that concludes the Willamette Lane portion of the, of the presentation. I'll turn it back to Lisa or Kat, the moderator. I just want to state how much we appreciate this working relationship and it's unique. I, I don't think that um, having an independent park district, having the uh, wealth of resources that you manage, I mean that as an environmental wealth, recreational wealth and and then being responsive to uh, not only nonprofit advocates such as Beyond Toxics, whose mission is to create thriving and healthy communities, but to uh, reach out to the community that lives on the outskirts of the properties you manage. And in the case of Doris Ranch, uh, the adjacent neighborhood is very low income and I would say uh, probably a high percentage of people who, uh, for whom English is their second language. So they're not likely to be on the same kind of media channels, you know, and so that um, 
that Willamaline might have traditionally used in the past. So, so appreciative that you're thinking of new ways to communicate. Um, and so I, we're, we can answer Q&A &A and, and keep the conversation going in that way, I think, unless, Jennifer, you want to add. Um, I think we covered all of our talking points. Perfect. OK, I'll get started. Um, I also want to thank the panelists. I've visited the Doris Ranch a couple of times. It's a truly beautiful area. If you haven't and you're in Eugene, I would definitely recommend it. Some of the questions in the Q&A function, what can individuals do to bring attention to this issue and to get involved? And that can be open to any of the panelists. Well, I, I guess I'll take a first shot at that. Um, to raise a, awareness of this issue. Um, I think that uh, what Michael had mentioned how uh, even years ago, members of the community had come to give testimony at the public, to the board of the Lamelaine Parks District to raise awareness uh, is the first and most important step. Um, we met some of those people only, be, we meaning Beyond Toxics, met some of those people because they had already taken that step and wanted the advice or the support of an advocacy group that holds a lot of knowledge in our staff. So it's not like we urged them to go, they came and sought us afterwards. But I think that uh, communicate that people who are passionate, concerned, should communicate that to whether it be their city, their county, their parks district, and invite these kinds of conversations to make change. Um, and also, we all know that our consumer habits are a big part of what can drive change. And um, in our own personal lives, and talking to our friends and neighbors, uh, abandoning pesticides, and we just have to, our opinion is, you know, um, pesticides are causing a great deal of harm, and especially in residential neighborhoods, uh, those are the kinds of things we should all try to avoid as much as possible. So our personal choices. And, and if I can add with that, I mean, as a public servant, basically, I mean, it is our job to listen to the people that we serve. And we're obligated, not only are we obligated, but we actually, we enjoy it, believe it or not. So every public entity, Willam Lane is, is one of those. We encourage people that have concerns, issues, want to give us feedback, you know, there is a public forum in which people can participate. They can email our board of directors or they can come and either virtually or in person at our regular board meetings, um, state what some of those concerns are and be heard. And that's one thing that I can absolutely guarantee you. You know, I have five bosses, five elected, uh, five elected uh, member of my board and uh, they all listen and they truly deeply care about this community. And I think that's one of the byproducts of, of how we got to some of these resolutions. We're not done yet, but I think we've definitely made some great progress. The other way that people can get um, um, involved is just find out, like I think Eric mentioned that, you know, a, a lot of our, we're, we're replacing a lot of the filbert trees because they have the Eastern filbert blight. And what we're doing is we're planting uh, new saplings, which are a blight resistant variety, which would then be less impactful on the environment and would have to be treated less, less chemicals. So any way that people can help advocate for those types of um, opportunities for replantings, for more environmentally friendly um, species, I think that goes a long way. And we're always looking for fundraising too. We had a whole campaign of Fight the Blight um, to help us um, you know, basically fund some of the replanting of the trees. So there's a number of different ways that, that people could get involved. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead, Jennifer. Sorry. I'll go after you. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to mention in this case, um, you know, the community member that brought our attention to this, you know, had been in communication with, with Will Amelaine, um, I think by phone and probably by email. And I, I know she had met with some of the staff at the park. Um, she didn't. <clears throat> She didn't feel like she was getting the results that she wanted. Um, she was asking them to stop applying pesticides altogether. Um, 
she had some not correct information about the pesticides that were being sprayed down there. Um, you know, the public records request process is a really important step in, in this. So we have a good understanding of what was going on there. In, our, in this case, um, our first request to Willamette Lane got lost because of uh, something was wrong with their, their email server. So it took a longer amount of time to get the records. But I mean, we had all kinds of questions about applicator licensing and whether it was appropriate for this situation. I mean, so there was a lot of back and forth and learning about what was going on down there before we could even, we were even to the point of, you know, having a good conversation and, and reaching solutions. <clears throat> Thank you, um, <clears throat> both Michael and Jennifer. The last thing I want to add, because it really needs to be said, is Lamelaine is a, a model, an example, a great example. We have to um, work at the policy level as well, and that is something Beyond Toxics does. We uh, bring issues that come up in community, because we are grassroots organizers, and we bring them to the attention of our elected officials to change policy. And so, um, for example, the slide we showed with the uh, pesticide applicators, pesticide records, uh, I'll just be quite honest and say, in my opinion, that is inadequate. And if that passes mustard, with our state agency, which they, they just said, okay, he's keeping records that meets the law. But then to me, you know, as an advocate, I need to know that I can work to change the requirements for record keeping so that there's a complete and accurate record that's available, you know, maybe it's to Willam Lane District, you know, maybe it's to Eric and Michael right away and not on somebody's little sheet of paper you know, that they keep in their, the cab of their truck. These things need, we have uh, software systems and data systems that can cheaply and easily collect uh, pesticide spray records. And these should be advanced. And it should be advanced through policy. So one way to help is to work with nonprofits such as Beyond Toxics to get these kinds of policies passed. Uh, transparency is always number one, good record keeping, and transparency are where we start. Thank you for that. Another question we have, this is specifically for Willamaline. Did you do any soil testing to show residual chemicals and levels? Uh, I could take that one. Uh, so uh, we have had samples collected out in the orchard actually were uh, partnering with uh, a couple different uh, graduate and doctoral programs at the University of Oregon right now, uh, looking at some um, uh, just a variety of different aspects of, of the Doris Ranch, uh, including management of the orchards themselves. Uh, I've not yet seen the, the results of those samples. Um, the, over, the supervising professor uh, has been on sabbatical, and so we haven't seen those samples come, come back yet. Um, but uh, it, those will be looking at a variety of different um, factors of the soil profile within the orchards. Uh, and I believe we'll be uh, capturing any, uh, any residual uh, buildup that may be in the soils themselves. Uh, Michael mentioned we uh, are in the process of doing uh, a multi-phase orchard replacement project. And just earlier this uh, late winter, early spring, uh, removed 19 acres of the original orchards that have subsequently been replanted uh, with a blight, resist blight resistant variety. And uh, part of those samples was to look at the, um, just the nutrient loading within the soils, pre-removal versus post. So uh, we'll be really interested to see the results of those uh, when they are available. Great, and then one of the other questions was, what are the biggest barriers to improvement in the pesticide policy reform area? And this can be open to anybody. I'm ready to tackle that one. <laughs> That's the work we do every day. Um, well, I, a couple of things, you know, there, these issues are complex. So I would say that um, number one is industry messaging. 
uh, small nonprofits such as Beyond Toxics cannot match the kind of uh, communications power of Monsanto or Bayer or Syngenta. Uh, and they have the backing of the fossil fuel companies and the chemical companies. Uh, fossil fuels are used to make pesticides and fertilizers. It's a big business. And um, fossil fuel companies would not like to see that business lost. They want to continue to expand the manufacture of pesticides. So uh, I think that's one of the biggest barriers. For example, when Beyond Toxics uh, worked in the state legislature asking for a ban on an organophosphate pesticide known as chlorpyrifos, which now has been, um, well, banned is maybe not the right word, but pretty much banned by the US EPA. Um, but when we were working on that in this, our state capital, despite the science, despite the evidence, despite the years of uh, EPA considering the danger of chlorpyrifos, uh, it was impossible, especially in the first year that we presented the bill to overcome the false messaging by the industries. So I'd say that's a big barrier because it's fueled by money. Um, and maybe another barrier that has to be acknowledged is increased labor costs of uh, managing things without pesticides. I mean, there's no, no argument about that. It does cost more to do it right. And we have to uh, understand that there are hidden costs that we never associate with pesticide use that really actually would not only, not, it wouldn't even it out. It would show that it, pesticide use is more costly when we look at the um, costs that are sort of put onto the communities, put onto our water quality, put onto our fish populations. Uh, there's been so much news lately about how our entire environment will collapse if we don't save our insects. And these pesticides are designed to indiscriminately kill insects, whether it's a bumblebee or something causing blight. And so the, the uh, labor costs are minuscule when you take into account the larger cost society civilization will pay if we don't create better balance in our ecosystems. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to add was fear. Fear is fear of change. Um, even some of the conversation I heard by the Willamalane board, there was a lot of fear there. Like, what if we change our practices? <gasps> what will happen? Will we lose the orchard? Or fear from farmers, if I can't spray my chlorpyrifos, am I gonna lose my business? You know, and we need solutions to overcome fear. So I just wanna acknowledge that fear is a powerful emotion and people resist change because of fear and then they stop learning. To, to, to answer that or to respond to that, Lisa, I think um, the fear thing even came up when um, the board of directors was going to make their decision, there were a couple of um, other hazelnut orchardists there who um, actually said if Willamalane was going to stop using the pesticides, um, they were going to kill the orchards. So um, yeah, there you go with the fear again. I think that was all the questions in the chat. Um, if any of you have anything else to add, I'm sure we'd all be thrilled to hear it. I have a question. I mean, we're in boxes, you know, so it's kind of hard to have a dialogue, but can panelists ask other panelists questions? Uh, is that okay? Um, you know, I was thinking back to the first time we met Eric and we were working on the uh, non-toxic Oregon and, and this is not a question to put you on the spot, but to just open up the conversation in case there might be other managed park uh, facilities or land management people listening in. So Willamette Lane is blessed to have parks that are adjacent to the Willamette River, which is part of why you have your name. Uh, Doris Ranch is on an amazingly beautiful bend of the river. And then in the right down river is the, oh, I always forget the name of the park where those pictures were taken. Um, Island I, Park. What? Island Park. 
Island Park. Well, that would make sense. Thank you. And so um, as a park district, have you thought of <coughs> have you thought about adopting special management practices for parks that are right near the rivers that are really the lifeblood of our state? Uh, because especially like with a sauna and other pesticides, it's on the label that these things tend to gravitate to groundwater and move through groundwater and groundwater leads to rivers. So I, I just, just a question of, as a conversation piece, like what do you think about when you think about the lands near the rivers and what suggestions would you have for policies for other parks? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And, you know, obviously Doris Ranch is a fairly unique um, public park for all the reasons that we've discussed today and uh, has a lot of you know, very unique management considerations associated with it because of the orchards that really aren't relevant to um, a lot of our other parks uh, within Willamette Lane's portfolio. Uh, I mean, use of Asana and, and fungicides, et cetera, product, um, conventional products like that and the rest of our, our parks portfolio would be you know, completely useless. There's, there's no reason to, to do that. Um, but in terms of uh, water quality and adjacency to the river, I mean, certainly a lot of our parks benefit greatly from that and the public appreciates that and enjoys the fact that Island Park and Clearwater Park and Middle Fork Path um, Harvest Landing, and we have several of them, and uh, we're always very conscious of that context uh, when we're looking at our management practices. I think uh, the uh, process that we've gone through with the ontoxics and the input that we've received from the public just further highlights the importance of making sure that we're being attentive to and listening to the public and um, giving as much information as we can to the district's decision makers to allow them to make prudent choices or, around uh, how we manage those lands optimally in balance of the public's interests, including environmental health. Um, and so I think that going forward will continue to be our practice as it has been previously. And with that too, Lisa, I mean, we're going through an accreditation process through the National Recreation and Parks Association we, where we have looked at all of our policies and procedures in and out of, but one of those would be uh, the integrated pest management. So Eric and his team, and we also have um, some natural resource professionals on our staff as well, there are, have already begun to look and develop uh, an update to our integrated pest management, which is gonna look at all the properties and how we manage them and what those best practices will be moving forward. So some exciting things are around the bend. Thank you both for that. That's that's great to know. Again, uh, hopefully modeling program. We we volunteer to be on any stakeholder committees. <laughs> Thank you, panelists. This was very informative. I know that it's very relevant for anybody living here in Eugene. We're all very aware of what's happening with our pesticides and just the environment in general. Um, attendees, if you have any follow up questions, feel free to send them to askpilk at gmail.com and I will be able to forward them on to the panelists. But thank you all for attending and panelists, thank you for your presentations. Thank you. Thank you all. It was a pleasure to be together with you in our boxes and hopefully we'll be meeting in person on the park bench soon. <laughs> <laughs>